All right, so in this section, we're gonna f do a, we're gonna do a, an overview of some of the common machine learning algorithms that are used in general, but also in the geospatial sciences. Note that we're not really gonna talk about the math or the behind it. We're mainly gonna focus on the con conceptualizing them and talking about how to use them and their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so again, this is not an exhaustive list of algorithms. It's just gonna be some of the more common ones that we that we use in in our field. Okay, so why use machine learning as opposed to like parametric methods like re like linear regression? So w one reason is that they are non-parametric. So if you have noisy, complex data, they're not going to make ass assumptions about the data distribution that may be incorrect. So they deal with com so they can deal with a complex feature space in terms of data that are of different types, like categorical and continuous. Um, data um, values that are on different scales that are far from normally distributive um, and also just large uh, feature spaces with lots of variables. They can deal with complex patterns and relationships between the variables that may not be um, you know, easily easily or easily done or possible in like a like standard like regression type environment or a parametric environment. They tend to be better at dealing with noisy and complex data than, the again, the more common parametric methods. And I found, and again, if you look across the, re with my own work, and if you look across the, res the research, that generally machine learning methods are, are providing higher accuracies than traditional parametric methods. So, and to summarize, these methods are really robust at dealing with the complex data sets that we deal with in the geospatial sciences and that other fields deal with. So that's really why we're trying to apply them. Okay, so we're gonna start off with arguably the simplest machine learning algorithm, and that is K nearest neighbor, where K basically just stands for a number. So like three nearest neighbors or four nearest neighbors or five. So K nearest neighbor, the idea is to compare a new sample to the nearest training samples in the feature space. So what we mean by feature space is within the, the variable space defined by the predictor variables. So for example, if this, if the, if this were a two-dimensional feature space, so this is the x-axis is like variable one and the y-axis is variable two, then you can plot all the points somewhere in that two-dimensional space. So if this red dot represented a new sample, then we could look at the training samples around it to try to determine what it would likely be in a categorical context. So again, k is just a number of neighbors to compare that sample to. Um, when you're doing classification, it's common to assign the new sample to the majority class of its neighbors. So for example, if we were using um, all the points that fell within this red radius. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's, that would be seven near neighbors. There would be one green, two blue, and f or sorry, two yellow, one green, and then four blue. So that means that we would assign this new sample to the blue class. Um, if you are doing regression, it's common to do an inverse distance weighted averaging. So there would be values associated with all of the near features. You would basically get an average using inverse distance weighting so the near features had a higher impact on the final continuous measurement than ones that are further away. And then if we're doing like a probabilistic prediction, we generally have two classes and you would be doing the proportion of the neighbors that are in that class as in one class versus another class. And it would get assigned to the class with the highest count and then the proportion of that would represent the probability. Okay, so effectively it's just based on nearness and a feature space. Now, this is obviously not too complicated when we're talking about two dimensions or even if we were talking about three dimensions. So in three dimensions, we'd be looking at a point floating around in a cube and then the training samples floating around inside of that cube. And then say if you were doing classification, you would find the nearest points in the cube and then take the majority class. But this can be expanded into four, five, 10, 11, you know, many, many dimensions, which we can't really visualize, but we can describe mathematically. So because this whole process is based on 
comparing a new sample to training samples in a feature space based on distance, you have to have so, some measure of distance in that feature space. And there's different methods to do that. Uh, one option is Euclidean distance, which is basically just a straight line distance. So here you can see these are the neighbors. So you're basically taking the location of the sample and, and differencing it from the location of the neighbor, squaring it, doing that for all the defined neighbors, and then taking the square root. So again, you can think of that as a straight line, directionally invariant distance in the feature space. Um, the Hamming distance is specifically used if you have categorical predictor variables. Uh, the Min Minskowski distance is similar to Euclidean distance, except that you can use a different power. So um, the higher the power, the higher the impact of near features in the space. And then a Manhattan distance is pretty much the same thing that we mean when we talk about Manhattan distance in geospatial, where you're talking about distance by summing the cardinal direction. So if there was three dimensions, you'd be looking at distance along the x, y, and z dimensions. Uh, one important note is since all this is based on distance, it's important that all the predictor variables be on the same scale, right? So if you had like one variable was a percentage from 0 to 100, and one was um, a, a length from like I don't know, like 1 to 2,000, and then another variable was like a concentration, like parts per million from like 5 to 7,000. Um, obviously, the ones that, ha that, would, that would mean that because the distance scales are different, there would be an inherent weight assigned to each of the variables, which you, you want them all to be considered equally weighted. So in those situations, you would want to rescale the data so they actually have the same scale and thus would be treated similarly in the feature space. Um, most of the time, that's done automatically by the algorithm, so you don't have to like do that beforehand. But you should always check and make sure it's doing that process for you. Okay, so choosing K. So again, it's based on the number of neighbors. So you have to f determine what number of neighbors makes the most sense. So generally, if you set a smaller K, you're going to get more local noise, which may, you may be interested in if you're looking for like you know um, very subtle patterns. If you use a larger K, it's going to be kind of more averaged out, less impact on local noise. It's been suggested that three to ten is generally good, but there's not really a hard number there. Instead, what you really want to do is optimize it. So you would test the algorithm using different values of k and see which one provides the best performance. And we'll talk about ways to do that type of optimization in, in one of the later videos. Uh, for a two-class problem, you should try to make k odd because you don't want to have a situation where there's a tie or an equal number of, of uh, of uh, each class in the neighbor. So an odd number would help with that. If it was more than two classes, then there's too many possibilities of proportion, so have even or odd really doesn't matter as much. Okay, so some strengths of the k nearest neighbor is that it's non-parametric, um, so it doesn't have any data uh, distribution assumptions. It's conceptually pretty simple to understand, and it, it'll always yield the same result if you give it the same training set and, and the same feature space because it's just the, me the distance measure will be the same every time. There's not like a stochastic or random component to it. Some weaknesses is it can be fairly slow to, to execute. It's computationally intensive if you have a large training set. Um, it tends to be negatively impacted by a large feature spaces. So if you the more dimensions you have the more complex it's going to be and the the more samples you would really need to like fully define that space um, it tends to be negatively impacted by noisy or irrelevant features so you're basically measuring along an axis or, or a dimension that is not very useful um, again you need to have the data be in consistent scale so it doesn't bias it towards one of the variables being more or less important and then generally, generally I found that this hasn't, isn't the optimal choice for me. It doesn't tend to yield the best results, but that doesn't mean it never does because, again, this is kind of a case-specific. Uh, this is more case-specific than, um, you know, hard rules. <clears throat> so uh, the next set of, uh, of algorithms we're going to look at are tree-based algorithms. So we're going to start off with the simplest, which is a single decision tree. And then we'll work our way up into the more the ensemble decision tree methods. 
So the concept of decision trees are actually fairly simple. So you, it's recursive partitioning the data into more homogeneous subsets. So for example, here we have some braced on topographic and, um, and image variable. So we're splitting based on slope into greater than or less than a certain value, then we split again, and then again and again. So effectively, you can think of it as like a dichotomous key. So you, for example, if you're trying to identify a leaf, you could look at like the venation pattern and then the shape and then work through a key to get to the to what type of leaf it is. It's kind of the same thing here. But instead of you providing those binary decision rules or splits, the computer's trying to learn them from the data. So it's binary, you know, yes or no recursive partitioning. So multiple yes or no um, partitions in the data. Um, and then there's got to be some measurement to determine what is a good split. And we'll look at that in a later slide. Um, the end of the, the bottom of the trees are called the leaf nodes. And those are going to represent the final categories or classes or value ranges that you're interested in. And generally, decision trees need pruning, which means they'll grow too large. There'll be too many um, decisions or splits, and they'll overfit to the data. So to make them generalize better, we have to cut off some of those lower branches by pruning. You can see there's a lot of tree analogies and language here. OK, so here's basically the idea. So you start with some data. You apply to that data a rule, a yes, a yes or no, a split, like a greater than or, e greater than or less than type rule. And then that splits the data. And then you apply rules to those subsets, and that further splits the data. And then, th then more, more rules are applied to even further split the data. And then you end up eventually with your leaf nodes that represent um, a set of rules that define a specific category or class. Note that a single class won't come out of the won't necessarily come out of the tree at one leaf node. So you could have multiple pathways or rule sets that define the same class. So for example, in my um, conceptualization here, we have like H coming out in multiple locations. Um, so that's the basic idea of a of a of a decision tree process. As I mentioned earlier, with decision trees, we generally have to prune. So what that means is it grows too large, it overfits to the training data, so you have to prune it back so it generalizes better. So here's an example for some real data. So we have the training data, so this is the data that the algorithm is learning from. So we start off with, oh, it produces um, 713 uh, splits and it only has an error rate of 1.6% on the train data. So that means it's getting like 98.4% uh, 98 of the train data correct. However, if you look at the test data, it's, it's, it, the error rate's a lot higher. It's 17.6%. So then we prune the tree. So now we can see that there's less uh, nodes or branches in the tree than there was before, and substantially less. You're looking at... Um, it's less than half as many. And now the training data error rate actually goes up. It's pretty substantially. But the testing data error rate actually decreased a bit. And that's because now the data isn't so overfit on the training data, so it's generalizing better to the test data. So in short, that's generally required if you're using a single decision tree. Now, one method for trying to determine the optimal pruning is to implement a complexity parameter. So in R part, which is a package in R, which um, Carrot can um, access and use to do decision trees, um, there, the CP parameter can be used to control this. So um, again, it's used to control the balance between overfitting and underfitting. So overfitting, we already talked about, is basically the idea that it's too well trained on the trained data and it doesn't generalize well. Underfitting basically just means it hasn't been trained enough yet. Uh, so if you want a model th that generalizes well and does not overfit, then you should, again, prune. Um, so generally, if you use the CP parameter in, uh, in our parts using decision trees, larger CP means a smaller tree, which means more pruning, and a smaller CP means a larger tree or less pruning. So again, you know, what value should you use? Well. Again, that has to be optimized or tested. So what we generally do is run multiple uh, models with different CP parameters and see which ones perform the best. And we'll talk about that process later on.
Okay, so in the last component of this is we have to have some measure that actually defines what we mean by a good split or a good decision rule in the tree. So we have to have some statistical measure of that. And there are different versions. So here are a few options. We have entropy, information gain, and then the Guinea impurity index. So here's what entropy is. So it, the idea is that you want to find the split or rule that minimizes entropy. So if a split is completely homogeneous, then entropy is zero. So what we mean in, by homogeneous in this case is that for a class, all of that class is on one side of the split and not the other. If a split rule took that class and split it equally so they were spread across the two data partitions, then it's not really doing a good job of separating that. Um, if samples, again, if samples are evenly divided, then again, entropy would be one. So you, so it's optimizing such that for a specific class, uh, the majority of the samples end on one side as opposed to um, spread out across the different data partitions. Information gain is kind of similar, but it's based on decrease in, in the entropy after the data set has been split there. Um, so you're basically comparing the entropy before and then after the split but it's still kind of entropy-based. The Gini Impurity Index um, is a measure of how often a random element from the set would be incorrectly labeled if it was, was randomly labeled according to the split rule. Again, it's a measure of like homogeneity. Um, this is minimized when all classes, again, fall on a, on one, of, a, of a specific class or on one side of the decision rule or node or data partition. So you, there's different methods, there are different statistical measures for optimizing these things. Or, or I guess deciding on these decision rules would be a better way to state it. Okay, let's look at this conceptually. So here we have a model where we're trying to predict, um, this is a, a burn index and we're using a band ratio to try to predict it. It doesn't really matter what we're looking at, it's more of a pattern. So the, the, white, uh, the white dots with the, with the black uh, outline, those are the actual data points. The red uh, diamond shapes represent a linear model to try to make a prediction of, these, uh, of, this, pa of this relationship. And then the blue like stepping pattern is, is using a decision tree to um, predict or assess or model this relationship. So the linear model is a line because it's modeling using a linear equation. And as you can see, this, there seems to be a bit of an arc to this, so a linear fit probably wouldn't be appropriate. Maybe like a, some type of polynomial or something might be more appropriate. It does appear that the decision tree is doing a better job at approximating that trend. It can, you can see that it's made up of these um, kind of stair-step patterns. So you might be thinking, well, a decision tree would make more sense to try to predict a category. How could you use it to predict a continuous variable? Well, that's basically done by having the, the leaf nodes not be a single value or a single category, but a range of values. And that is why you end up with this kind of stair-step pattern. So you, the tree is defining ranges of values um, as a continuous variable as opposed to um, uh, you know, a, a category, for example. So in short, you can use decision trees to do both classification and regression. So what are some strengths of decision trees? So first off, they are non-parametric, similar to the other methods. They're pretty easy to interpret and in that you can read the dichotomous key and try to determine what rules define a specific class. However, that's only true to a point. I mean, if you get a very complicated tree, it might be hard to make any sense of it if it has you know, a lot of branching. Um, it doesn't require a lot of user-defined parameters. Generally, it's just the pruning that you have to consider and you know, what, maybe what method you're using to determine the, the best rule, you know, entropy versus uh, Guinea in index, for example. Um, it can be used for both regression and classification. Um, it's, it, you can use uh, predictor variables that are in different scales, and you know, in contrast to KNN. Um, you can even use categorical variables or nominal data and continuous data. Um, yeah, as, as mentioned there, um, it's generally really quick to both train it and to use it for prediction, and it can generally work on large data sets. Some weaknesses of decision trees is that 
small changes in the training data can result in very different trees, especially if you have small training data set. So if you run a decision tree and then run it again, you actually might get different trees because there's sort of a randomness uh, built into it. It's not very robust to noise, so that can, can cause some error if you've got noisy or complex data. It can have local minimum issue where it basically gets stuck in a in, in, in a in like kind of a, a pit and it doesn't move on to actual the correct location. I've always had this explained to me as if you were trying to get out of a room and the correct way to get out of the room was through the door, that the algorithm could go out the window instead and it would get the job done even though it wasn't the best way to do it. And again, it also needs pruning or it'll overfit. Okay, so how could we potentially improve upon just using a single tree? Well, so one option would be that we could use multiple trees and allow them to work together to try to improve the model. And that's what ensemble decision tree methods do, including boosted decision trees and random forest. So we're going to start off by talking about boosted decision trees. So again, this is an ensemble decision tree method, which basically means it uses a bunch of trees and not just a single tree. Um, it's an iterative process, so one tree and then another tree and then another tree. Um, you use the entire training set in each tree as opposed to a subset, and I mention that here because this is, differs from how random force works, which is the next method. Um, it tries, to, it tries to, f to fix misclassifications in prior trees in the subsequent trees. So the idea is after a tree is ran, it looks at which samples were misclassified and it weights them higher. So that when the data gets thrown into the next tree, it focuses on trying to fix the misclassification problems that were in the original tree. So that's why it's an iterative process. Um, this isn't really just one method. There's a wide variety of different ways to do this, uh, this boosting or this iterative process. So here's an add a, some examples. Add a boost, C4.5, C5, gradient boosting, and there's others. Um, you can use this both for classification and regression, similar to how regression is implemented in a single decision tree. Uh, because you have these trees working together, you really don't have to do pruning, so that's not a required input parameter. parameter. And most of the time, I find that I get improvement over a single decision tree, as would make sense, because you're able to model more complexity in the data and fix classification problems by having this iterative process. So that's boosted decision trees. All right, so looking at another option is random forest. Uh, random forest is generally my one of my go-to algorithms. It's generally random forest or uh, maybe like gradient boosting or like support vector machines. So this is the concept behind random forest. So again, it's similar to, um, an, to boosted decision trees. It uses decision trees and it uses an ensemble decision trees. Uh, random forest traditionally use the Guinea index of impurity to determine the best splits. So here's the basic process. So you start off with some data, and that data is randomly subset using, using bagging, which is basically bootstrap sampling or random sampling uh, with replacement. And that subset of data gets fed into a tree. And then within the tree, each node can only select from a subset of the available training variables. So in essence, each tree is only seeing a subset of the data and at each node, a subset of the available predictor variables. So what you end up with is a bunch of trees that have seen slightly different data and slightly different predictor variable space. So they're weak because they've seen less data, weaker because they've seen less data, and because um, they maybe haven't seen all the variables. But they're now not as correlated with each other because they've have that differences. So this is the concept of an ensemble weak classifiers that generalize well and perform well when they work together. So the key components, again, and how this differs from boosting, is that it uses a subset of data in each tree. And that's the bagging process. This is basically just random sampling with replacement. And then attempting, and then it also tries to um, use a subset of the variables in each, in each tree or each split node. Um, again, and that results in a reduction in the correlation between the trees and then an ensemble weak classifiers that together act as a generalize well and produce a strong or can produce a strong uh, uh, accuracy or classification. Okay, so again, random force uses the genuine index of impurity, which we already talked about. 
So the goal is to try to have a split have a large percentage or proportion of a class on one side of the split versus another, and this is just a measure of that. And then I also mentioned that it uses bagging, which is basically bootstrap sampling or random sampling with replacement. So for each tree, generally two-thirds of the data are thrown into the tree and while one-third uh, remain out. So think of it as like a bag of marbles. So if you had a bag of marbles with um, 100 samples in it, then for one tree, you would pull out two-thirds of the marbles and feed those to the tree. Then in the next tree, you throw all the marbles back in, shake it up, and then pull out a different two-thirds. So it'll see some of the same samples, but they'll likely not be exactly the same because it's a different random split. Um, so that's, that's the idea. Note that you can also change that. So if you don't want it to be a two-thirds to one-third split, you can adjust the proportions, but I generally just leave it set to that. Um, because each tree doesn't actually see all the data points, there are some withheld data. That's called the out-of-bag data, or OOB data. And then you can use that data to actually assess the accuracy of the model kind of internally. Okay, so if you're doing random forest modeling, the user generally has to find two parameters. So the number of trees. So um, a general, generally I shoot for like 500 trees. Um, it's generally been shown that trees just it kind of it doesn't really start to decrease the accuracy if you add a lot of trees it just kind of stabilizes and you're not really gaining anything but you are losing in terms of computational efficiency so if you're not sure you can always set it to a fairly high number again i generally shoot for 500 or more and then you also have to select the number of variables randomly selected for splitting at each node which in the random force package in r is called m try so again that's just the number of of variables of the, if you have 100 predictor variables, it's the number of those that are available to be randomly selected from at each node. Um, the default is generally the square root of the number of variables. However, that might not actually the best, be the best or optimal setting. So um, that is generally optimized. Again, we'll talk about those methods later. So what are some strengths of random force? So again, it's non-parametric, similar to the other methods we talked about. Um, it's, it's been claimed that it doesn't overfit, but I would argue that it does overfit. Um, all machine learning algorithms overfit. The issue, I think you can make an argument that it doesn't have an overfitting problem in comparison to similar machine learning techniques. It tends to be very efficient. It can tr be trained very quickly and generally predict new samples fairly quickly. You can get its robust complex feature space and that you can give it a lot of predictor variables and it may not have a large impact on the accuracy. And I've seen that in my own work where reducing the number of variables doesn't seem to impact or improve the accuracy much. Um, it generates an unbiased estimate of generalization error using the out-of-bag data, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, can, it can perform classification regression or provide back probabilistic models, um, which again, it's just a, a, uh, a, a kind of implement, it, it's similar to classification, uh, but instead of turning back a hard class, it's a probability of being a class. It's fairly fast. Um, it can provide an estimate of predictor variable importance. It's generally computationally lighter than boosting because each tree is kind of separate and it's not an iterative process. It can be faster. And I've seen that in my own work. Generally, boosting takes a lot longer to run than random forest does. Um, you don't have to prune, again, because you're running an ensemble of weak trees. Um, it only has two user-defined parameter parameters, and you can also incorporate categorical predictor variables similar to single trees and boosted de decision trees. Some weaknesses, um, to train the model, it has to have both presence and absence. So if you don't have absence data, you'd have to create some like pseudo absence data. It is computationally intensive, but all these methods are fairly computationally intensive. And with modern computers, we don't tend to worry about this much. Um, in comparison to something like deep learning, these are actually not that computationally intensive. Um, it's not fully automated, but again, um, none of these really are. And it's a bit of a gray box, so it's kind of in between a black box and you know something that's fully interpretable. Um, that's one argument you hear a lot about machine learning is that it's a black box, so people don't always feel comfortable using it because they don't know what's going on. You know, so like a regression reduces a, an equation with coefficients and it's interpretable. Um, but whereas machine learning doesn't do that. One of the gray aspects of, of random forest is that it does provide some interpretation. So like variable importance, out-of-bag error, 
and also you could look at individual trees to get a sense of what's going on in each tree. But it's still not not very interpretable, or you um, it's it, you don't you, you can't get a full sense of what's going on in there. <laughs> Okay, as I mentioned earlier, you can actually estimate the importance of variables using um, random forest. So basically the variable is like ran randomly, randomly permutated um, and then by either like removing it or, or altering the values, it looks at how much the accuracy decreases when that variable is no longer present. And the more the accuracy decreases, the more um, the more important it likely was. And that's measured by trying to assess the prediction of the out-of-bag samples from each tree. Um, in the random force package, this can be assess or accessed through the importance function. Um, one note is if you have variables that are heavily correlated with each other, then this can be unbiased, or sorry, be a biased estimate. So there are some um, iterations or alterations of this that takes that into account and some of those methods have been implemented in inside of R such as with the party package using conditional variable importance. You can and then also you can get importance based on the guinea index or the out of bag error rate. So uh, here's just another example, same text, different example. So in this output it looks like the near infrared band was most important followed by the height um, and then looks like the red band was fairly important. So again, it's a relative importance of different predictor variables, which makes the model a bit more interpretable. And again, to estimate its own error, it uses the out-of-bag data, which are basically the withheld samples um, in each tree. So effectively, it tries to predict back to those withheld samples, and then averaging across the trees, it can provide an estimate of, accurate, of its accuracy or error rate. Um, I've generally found that to be fairly accurate and unbiased as long as your training data are randomized. If you don't have randomized training data, then um, that isn't necessarily unbiased um, because it's not representative of the population. So in short, I really wouldn't use this method unless you have provided it with an unbiased or randomized training data set. Um, it's okay to not necessarily use randomized training data, but not in this context if you're trying to use this out-of-bag error. Okay, so um, you can also use it for regression. This slide provides some uh, discussion of how that works if you want to read through it. I put a note on a video on a video there, or, to, or a note on a, for a video that explains it in more detail. It can also do probabilistic type modeling. Um, I use this a lot when I'm trying to make likelihood type surfaces, like the wetland predictions I showed in an, in an earlier video. Um, so it's the probability for, of a sample or location being in a specific class as opposed to a yes or no type output or categorical output. Again, it's basically similar to cl classification, but you're using uh, the li you're getting the likelihood output as opposed to the hard classification. And effectively, how this works is it looks at the proportion of trees or nodes that that voted for that specific class, the, that specific class at that point. So generally, it would just assign the output to the one that had the highest proportion of votes. But if you use the probabilistic method, it'll look at those proportions to, pro to provide a likelihood or probabilistic output. Um, so whenever you use this in, a pre in the predicting mode in ARC, or, or sorry, in ARC, in R, um, then you just set the type of prob and it'll spit out probability as opposed to a classification. And this slide provides uh, some additional resources associated um, with random force in particular. Okay, so our last algorithm we're going to look at is support vector machines or SVMs. Um, I would argue that this has become the kind of default classification method now within the field of uh, remote sensing. Uh, so you see this used a, a good bit for you know, classification problems. So the idea is basically to find the optimal boundary that separates two classes in a multidimensional feature space. So if we're looking at this example, and this was taken um, from this, uh, this open um, uh, wiki, uh, wiki uh, article, you can, this is the best plane, and it is defined as the one that is furthest from both data sets, the optimal margin. So it's the linear boundary that gives the best separation between the classes or the best gap between the classes. 
Um, it turns out that to do this, you don't actually need to use all of the samples. Instead, you just use the ones that are nearest to the boundary and are thus used to define it. And those are called the support vectors, and that's what gives this algorithm its name. Um, one complexity is that most data in a complex feature space cannot be separated by a nice plane or line. So to deal with that, we have to transform the data into a higher dimensional space, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, this was originally developed for a two-class problem, which means that it was you know, yes or no, or like forest, not forest. But many times we want to separate out multiple classes. And the way that's done is using like a one against many type situation where you basically train one, try to separate one um, class from the others and then do that for all the classes and then combine the models to get a multi-class classification. Um, and if you have data that is inseparable, so you, no matter how you place a boundary, you're going to have some points on the wrong side of the line, you can incorporate a slack variable or cost parameter to, uh, to uh, deal with that. Okay, so some other kind of notes on this. Uh, so again, lots of times we will have a feature space where you can't actually se separate the classes with a linear boundary. So for example, if you're looking at this, this is a complex nonlinear boundary that could not be approximated with like a formula. Um, and here we have something similar. So how could we actually get a more linear boundary? So the idea is that you use this kernel trick in which you transform the data into a higher dimensional space where boundaries that were, were not originally linear or simple become more linear or more simple, and thus the points are easier to separate in that space than the, than the original space. So in this, um, this example, we start off in like a two-dimensional space on a plane where the separating boundary is actually pretty complicated. Then we use the kernel trick to transform the data into a three-dimensional space, and now we can separate it with a nice linear plane as opposed to this complex line. And the similar process is going on here where you're transforming the points from one space to another where this boundary now becomes more linear. So prior to this trick, um, it, this would only work reasonably well on features that or, or uh, spaces where things were linearly separable. Once this kernel trick became available, this really opened up what we could do with um, the support vector machines. Um, this is just a note on support vectors. This is from a paper by uh, Pau et al. So this is looking at three land cover categories in a two-dimensional space, so band one and band five. Um, so you can see that they're clustered pretty well, um, but what we're really noting here is what the support vectors are. So note that the support vectors are the ones around the margin. So really those are the only training samples that are being used to define the boundary. It's not all of them, it's just the support vectors as this uh, demonstrates. Okay, so for doing, um, for doing support vector machines, there's a couple things you have to define or set. So you have to define a kernel, so how, that's how it's projected into the mathematical method to project the data into a higher dimension. So there's linear, polynomial, radial basis, sigmoid, and remote sensing we tend to use a radial basis function or sometimes a polynomial. And then specify a cost parameter or slack variable. Again, that is how it's going to deal with features that are on the wrong side of the boundary. And then depending on what kernel you use, there will be different kernel-specific parameters. So for example, radial basis can require a gamma parameter. And then this can also do regression. So effectively, you're just doing the regression inside of this multi-dimensional feature space as opposed to, um, as opposed to the original feature space to try to come up with the regression formulas for these um, complex surfaces that are in a, in a new space or as opposed to the original space where it would be nonlinear. All right, but it's still basically making use of support vectors to define a boundary. Okay, so what are the strengths of support vector machines? So first off, um, it can deal with complex and nonlinear data, especially when we're using the kernel trick. Um, you can do classification, regression, and probabilistic modeling with it, similar to random forest. Um, it, again, it uses, it uses this method called quadratic programming optimization, so it doesn't suffer from local minima similar to single decision trees or like a neural network. 
Um, it uses data points close to the boundary, so you actually only need a small set of the training samples. So you might think, well, that means that you don't actually have to give it that many training samples. Well, that's not actually true because you need to give it enough samples so that it can find adequate support factors. Um, it's not generally affected strongly by outliers, and again, it's fairly robust. Um, some people have argued that it doesn't really need to be optimized. I've generally found that optimizing it can't hurt, or at least trying to assess whether it will improve it. Again, we'll talk about optimization methods in, in a later video. Weaknesses, um, you have to train it, and these both presence and absence, similar to random forest. And there are some user-defined parameters that you have to set. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, th these are not the only methods. These are just some examples, and I picked them because we commonly use them in remote sensing and, uh, and uh, GIS and spatial predictive modeling. But there are other options. So for example, in the tree-based methods, there's rotation forest, which is um, basically random forest that incorporates principal component analysis to decorrelate variables. There's conical forest, which uses conical component analysis to decorrelate. There's maximum entropy, uh, which is a common method used for presence-only habitat ecological type modeling. There's artificial neural networks and deep learning. Deep learning is built on top of artificial neural networks. We didn't get into that here. It's based on the structure of the brain and uh, you know inter interconnected synapses. Um, again, um, I have generally found that artificial neural networks don't do the best job for the types of problems that I'm working with. Um, deep learning can do a great job, but it needs a lot of training data. So uh, again, we're really covering that here. There's also learning vector quantization, extreme learning machines, and many others. So I just wanted to note that that if as and and there'll be more in the future. So um, more than likely, if you end up doing this type of stuff in your research or your career or your work, um, you're going to come up against new algorithms. You're going to have to um, learn to interact with. Um, just as a side note on MaxInt, uh, we're not really covering that here, but it's a good method, especially if you only have presence um, data and you all have absence data. Um, this tool was originally developed as a Java um, as, as a Java library and your know, Java code. Um, there has, there is, there, sorry, there are two different um, R packages in which you can access that Java to do the modeling within R, and one of those is MaxInt. So I just wanted to note that those exist. Okay, so that's the end of this section. Uh, now we're going to look in the next section at how we actually assess models once we've created them.